Greetings Earthlings, today I'm back with a review of a brand new interface iteration from Audient. That interface being the ID14, and if you are interested in this interface, it will cost you around $300. Like always, I'll throw some links down below. And in the sake of full disclosure, I do want to let you know that Audient did send me the ID14 and the ID4 for the sake of doing this review as well as a bunch of other tests. With that being said, for this review, I have the Rode NT1 connected directly to the ID14. My gain is set at around 1 o'clock. I am recording at 24-bit, 48 kilohertz. I will not do any kind of post-processing, but I may have to boost it a little bit in post, so check the doobly-doo to see what I diddly did. And now let's talk about what comes in the box. What a shocker, you are going to get the audio interface. You're going to get a USB-C to USB-C cable, a quick start guide, and you get access to a bunch of software that you're able to download off of their website. Then as far as the build quality of this thing, it feels absolutely outstanding. The entire chassis is made out of metal and feels extremely durable. The dials are very tight and non-wobbly. The switches have a nice click to them when you flip them over, on, and off. They don't feel weak at all. The buttons have a nice tactile click as well, so you know when you've pressed them. And the XLR combination jacks are not loose at all either. Nothing out of the ordinary. Next, to walk through the features of this interface, on the top you will find input 1 and 2 gain controls. You will also find independent 48 volts phantom power on off switches. Next to that, you will find a meter ranging from negative 36 dB all the way up to 0 dB, which will show you the level of the headphones or speakers that you're adjusting, as well as your playback level. Beneath that, you will find a USB light letting you know that you're plugged in and getting sufficient power. Then on the bottom right of the interface, you will find three buttons. The first one being a button to select the monitors and allow you to adjust the level for the monitors. On the right hand side, you will find a headphone button to allow you to adjust the level of the headphones. And in the center, it has the ID button, which you're able to assign to do specific functions from the software. If you want to do anything like that, but if you don't, you can just use this to scroll around on your computer. Then above that you have the massive volume control which you will use to control the headphone and the monitor levels and it also is a massive button. So if you push this, what I found is it mutes the computer playback. On the front of the interface you will find a single high Z quarter inch input which does allow you to plug an instrument directly into this. We'll test that a little bit later. And this also takes over the XLR port in the rear of the interface, meaning you cannot run a mic into channel one and an instrument into this high Z input as well. You just need to pick one or the other. And then on the other side of the front you will find a quarter inch and eighth inch headphone jack for computer playback and zero latency monitoring. Then on the rear of the interface, you will find the USB-C port for data transfer and power. That is right, this is a bus powered interface. You will then find an optical input for ADAT or SPDIF expansion. So you are able to add up to eight additional external preamp channels to this if your external preamp allows for that. Then you'll find four balanced quarter inch outputs so you can run a set of monitors as well as run to a set of headphone amplifiers if you want. And lastly, you will find two XLR combination jacks for mic or line level inputs. And if it matters to you at all, this interface is made in China. Then as far as the specs, this interface records up to 24 bit 96 kilohertz the preamps have a gain range of 58 dB, an EIN of negative 129 dBA, a signal to noise ratio of 101 dBA, 48 volts of phantom power, and here are the output specs for this interface if you're interested. And I do want to mention that the big upgrade from Gen 1 to Gen 2 for the ID14 really appears to be the A to D and D to A converter. The A to D converter got a 5 dB dynamic range improvement, and the D to A converter got a 9 dB dynamic range improvement. So quite a big improvement over the prior gen. Then very briefly, I want to talk about the main differences between the ID4 Mark II and the ID14 Mark II. 
The most obvious difference is going to be the inputs and outputs. The ID4 has only one XLR combination for a mic line level input, and then you have one quarter inch high Z input for an instrument. On the ID4, you only have one set of balanced monitor outputs, but on the ID14, you have two sets of balanced outputs. Both interfaces do have the quarter inch and eighth inch headphone jack. Also, as you can see, the ID14 has speaker and headphone selection lights. The ID4 only has one speaker light, so you will only be able to adjust the output together. You won't have individual mixes or output levels for the headphones and the monitors. Another very big difference that I think some folks actually think of as a pro for the ID4 is it does not have the software console to create a mix. It just has this single monitor mix dial to mix between computer playback and zero latency monitoring. So if you are looking for that physical dial, the ID4 is going to be the one for you. But if you want more granular digital control, the ID14 will offer that. And lastly, you have a much better and much more granular meter on the ID14 over the ID4. Next, like always, in order to really test out the preamps, I have the SM7B connected directly to the interface. I have my gains set at around 4 o'clock, and I'm hitting around negative 9 to negative 6 dB, so a very healthy level when I get a little bit louder. Very good level there. I'll be quiet so you can hear the noise that's generated at this gain setting. And there you go. Perfectly capable of driving the SM7B. I'll even increase it to 100%. And now the gain is set to 100%. I will not do any kind of boosting in post just so you can hear that you can 100% drive the 7B with this interface. I'm hitting around negative 6 to negative 3 dB. Very risky, very little headroom. If I get excited, I hit 0 dB and clip. But I just wanted to demonstrate what it sounds like 100% on the gain dial without any boosting or anything in post. There you go. Next, I want to test out the ID14's preamp noise performance. I'm going to throw on an XLR connector with a 150 ohm resistor and slowly increase the gain so you can hear what kind of noise the preamps generate. Then when we look at latency, with the sample rate set at 48 kilohertz and an I.O. buffer size of 64 samples, we have a 9 millisecond round trip latency, or 4.5 milliseconds output. When we jump up to 128 samples, we have 11.5 milliseconds round trip, or 5.5 milliseconds output. And when we jump up to 256 samples, we have a 17 milliseconds round trip, or 8.5 milliseconds output. Then when we bump our sample rate to 96 kilohertz and the I.O. buffer is at 64 samples, we have a 7.5 millisecond round trip or 3.7 milliseconds output. Increasing to 128 samples, we have a 9 millisecond round trip or 4.3 millisecond output. And finally, increasing to 256, we have 11.5 milliseconds round trip or about 6 milliseconds of an output latency. Next, I'm going to go ahead and plug my electric guitar and my electric bass directly into this thing so you can hear the raw DI input. Then I will switch back and forth between the raw as well as an amp simulator version, and then I will create a full mix with all DI amp simmed guitars and basses. <laughs> Thank you. 
Next, I want to address a question I know I will get. Can it drive difficult to drive headphones? In my experience, it's perfectly capable of even driving the Sennheiser HD 650s, which are 300 ohms and fairly difficult to drive. Drives them with no problem, able to get a perfectly listenable level and a clean signal as well. Now here is a very quick look at the ID software that you use to mix your audio for the ID14. I am not going to be doing a huge massive deep dive on this thing, just a quick rundown. You are obviously going to have faders for your mic inputs, mic 1 and 2. This is going to be what you hear in the headphones as well as the monitor outputs. You are also able to make some minor adjustments here, one being a 10 dB boost. Let me engage that. And now the microphone should be 10 dB louder. And I think I just clipped, but there you go. You're also able to invert the phase if you have any phase issues there. Then as far as the computer playback, mine is running through DAW 1 and 2. If I hit play on some music, you can see that showing up on the meters. You cannot hear it. I'm not recording that, I'm not capturing it, but you do have the ability to mix the zero latency monitoring with the mic channels and the computer playback with the DAW 1 and 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you're also able to create a couple of different Q mixes. Click on the Q mix that you want to adjust and then you are able to create the mix that you want to send out to that Q mix. I think that is pretty much all that I wanted to cover with this quick run through of the ID software. I wanted to make it clear that you do need to download and open this software in order to actually make the mix between zero latency and computer playback. But also I do want to point out that you do have access to a loopback setting for this interface. You can select one of the outputs for loopback. So you are able to capture your computer playback for a stream or for recording. However, the loopback source is not going to be a mix minus to my knowledge. So if you are using it for a podcast, keep that in mind. Okay, it is no secret that I loved the original Audient ID4. I thought this thing was awesome. And the Mark II versions of their ID series interfaces are just better. They're improved. How could I not like them? <laughs> but first up, let's talk about the pros. And the first pro is the preamps. They are insane. I could look at specs all day long, but the moment that I measure them, throw in that 150 ohm resistor, and then look at the measurement and see a flat, uniform silence, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, and I am always blown away. On top of that, it has plenty of gain to drive the SM7B, and I would say it has plenty of gain to drive the SM7B cleanly, to the point where I do not think that you would need a fed head or a cloud lifter or anything like that. Next, I know I sound like a broken record because I talk about this in every audience review. The DI input on their interfaces is absolutely insane sounding, and I think it sounds probably one of the best of any interfaces that I've tried. The expandability of the ID14 is also amazing at this price point. You don't typically see the ADAT or SPDIF expansion capabilities and having that really makes this something that you can grow with as opposed to just getting stuck with two inputs and then having to upgrade to a different interface down the line. Also, they did not have to do it, but I think it is a very nice touch to see the second set of balanced quarter inch outputs. Just makes it easier to run to more headphones or anything like that. The latency on this thing, very workable. I had no issues running amp sims. And the headphone output is perfectly capable of driving difficult to drive headphones like the 650s. Then as far as cons, there's really nothing that sticks out to me that I dislike about this interface. It just works and it does everything I need it to do. But I do know that some folks are going to hate having to have that software on their computer. They would prefer just having a physical mix dial for computer playback and zero latency monitoring. But that's a lose-lose because 50% of people are going to want the software to get more granular control. The other 50% or maybe even less will want that physical dial so they don't have to download anything. Another thing that I noticed, it's less of a con and more of an FYI. I was not able to get this to play nicely with Discord. 
I had to ultimately create a new aggregate device using loopback to route my microphone input to Discord and get it to function properly. So if you're buying the ID14 for Discord, keep in mind you may have to do some fancy digital routing to get your mic there. And to wrap up, would I recommend the Audient ID4? That's difficult. I mean, of course I would recommend it, but there are questions that ought be answered. That's why it's difficult. The reason I'm saying it's difficult is because around the $300 price point, you have some killer options with the Moto M2 and the SSL2+. Plus. Now, if you do need the ADAT and SPDIF expansion, ID14, absolutely I recommend it. If you want some more color to your recording, if you want some SSL flavor, and if you need MIDI IO, SSL2 Plus would be the route I would go. Or if you want the fancier display, if you want the better meters, you want the MIDI IO, then the Motu M2 would be the route that I go with. Really, any of these would be great. They all have amazing preamps. They all have amazing features. The ID14 just stands out with that expansion if that is something that you need. Okay, I think that's all that I have for you today. I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. What do you think of the ID14 Mark II? Let me know down below. If you found this video fun, interesting, or helpful, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Hated it, thumbs down. Want more videos, subscribe, logo down beneath me. And if you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, you can click that join button and join at the $5 tier or higher, or you can head over to patreon.com slash podcastage and join at the $5 tier or higher. Really does help me continue to continue to bring you these videos. I love you so much I can't even speak straight. <laughs> I will talk to you all later. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Bye.